Well, good morning again. Uh, sorry about being a little bit late, but welcome to our morning walk with the apostles. Today's Thursday, September the 16th, 2021. Great to be with you today. I hope that your day's gotten started well and that you have uh, a profitable day ahead of you. We're going to return to Paul's voyage to Rome, looking from Acts chapter 27 in just a moment. But first, let's take time to have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for the day and the blessings that lie before us, for your being with us and watching over us through the past night. <clears throat> Help us today, Father, to seek to always do your will, to look for opportunities and take advantage of those opportunities to share the good news of Jesus and the gospel. Father, I pray you be with us this morning as we make this uh, morning walk through some verses in Acts 27, that we may be encouraged by what we read about Paul's difficulties on the ship uh, voyage to uh, Rome, and yet his perseverance and his faith and trust in you, and may that encourage and uplift us. We thank you for that. We thank you for the Christ. We thank you for the Bible. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, <clears throat> as we return to our <clears throat> study of Paul's voyage to Rome, the decision has been made to set sail from Fair Havens at a most dangerous time to be sailing on the Mediterranean Sea. This decision was arrived at against Paul's advice. A few hours from their destination, disaster struck. Verse 14 of Acts 27 says that before very long, there rushed down from the land, that is, from the towering mountains of the island of Crete, a violent wind called Euroquilio. Now, this Greek word is translated, or the Greek word that is translated violent, is a form of the word from which we get our English word typhoon. Uroquilio was a sailor's name for a typhoon-like nor'easter. It is a hybrid word combining the Greek word for east wind with the Latin word for north wind. This wind blew them from the shelter of Crete, and the ship had access to no more harbors, just the open sea. Verse 15 says, When the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. In other words, the ship was at the mercy of the wind and the waves. Now, after being driven to the southeast for several hours, Verse 16a says, we ran under the shelter of a small island called Clauda. Let me switch over to a map here and uh, get us oriented some geographically. Now here's just a map of the general area and they have set sail from Fair Havens. They're about the middle on the south side of the island of Crete. Now, this small island of Clauda is kind of under that line that's been drawn for uh, assumed route uh, that Paul's ship took. And I've drawn that orange arrow in there to, uh, uh, to point to it to help us understand. So let's go back now to, uh, to looking at the text. Again, uh, verse 16a says that they ran under the shelter of a small island called Clauda. Now, taking advantage of that, this kind of a momentary lull, they all worked feverishly to make the vessel as seaworthy as possible. Evidently, even Luke pitched in to help secure the lifeboat, which was being pulled behind the ship. Now, remembering the struggle and perhaps 
his blisters. He said, verse 16b, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. Again, that's the lifeboat, the small boat they towed behind. Now that boat would either sink or be dashed to pieces if it were left in the water with the storm that was developing. It might be needed later as well to reach shore. So when it was pulled in, however, it was probably nearly swamped with water. Verse 17a says, after they had hoisted it, that is the boat, up, they used it, or they used supporting cables and undergirding the ship. Now those supporting cables were either ropes or chains that were placed around the hull and tightened with winches to hold the vessel together in the storm. Then verse 17b says, fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis, they let down the sea anchor. Verse 17b. Now let's go back to a map and let me draw a box around the area there on the lower left hand corner of the map right under Paul's route. Uh, that little dip there in the Mediterranean is the, what's known as the shallows of Sirtis. These, uh, these were sandbars along the uh, that stretched along and off of the coast of North Africa. Uh, basically known as a ship graveyard and feared by sailors. Now the area was many miles to the south of where they are, but they knew uh, how far that a ship could be driven in a storm. However, before they reached land, they were driven 500 miles to the west. Again, let's go back to that map. And you see the line that the, the man that, that made this map drew a line and he put the word storm in just a wavy line. And so that's kind of the direction that they're going to be going to the northwest, but they were afraid they might be blown to the southwest toward those uh, sandbars. <clears throat> the shallows of Sirtis were much closer, actually, uh, than, uh, than that to the south. And we're told that they let down the sea anchor, hoping to slow the ship. Now, this Greek word that's translated sea anchor could mean many things. It's the same word that's used later in verse 19, where it's translated the ship's tackle. Opinions differ as to what the word means here in verse 17. Um, but by the time that they do this, the ship had been blown past the protection of the little island of uh, Clauda. And they could do nothing but, as verse 17c says, let themselves be driven along. You know, there's a thought here. You and I can learn from those sailors of long ago. When tempest hit our lives, we need to do what we can to minimize the damage. Make everything as secure as possible and prepare to ride out the storm. Now, if those who were on board with Paul had hopes that the storm would soon blow itself out, they were disappointed. Verse 18a begins with the next day and they are still being violently storm-tossed. Put yourself in their place. Hear the howling winds, the creaking timbers of the ship, the straining ropes holding it all together. See in the sky the swirling black clouds, the angry waves of the ocean as they crash and wash over the deck. The ship is pitching up and down on the raging sea and you struggle to keep your footing. 
The salty spray of the waves stings your face. And you gag on salt water. Storms are, are really painful. Whether they are on the sea or the storms of life. Well, back to their, the Paul in the ship. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And so in verse 18, after Luke tells us that they were still being violently storm-tossed, he says that they began to jettison the cargo, that is, throw it overboard. Now their livelihood depended on that cargo, but they were more concerned about their lives than their livelihood. Verse 19 says, And on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands to lighten the ship. They've cast overboard everything they did not absolutely need. And the storm continued. Verse 20a, Neither sun nor stars appeared for many days. And during that time, they had no compass in those days. No sextant to reckon their position. Navigation was dependent upon the sun by day and the stars by night. Therefore, they had no idea where they were. For all they knew, they could founder on the shallows of Sirtis at any moment or crash into some other hidden reef. For close to two weeks, the storm battered the ship and its occupants until both were ready to break apart. Luke wrote in verse 20, Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, from then on all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. Well, that is the low point of this narrative. The men were soaked, numb with cold, exhausted to the bone, and weak from hunger. Verse 21a, Luke says, they had gone a long time without food. Oren Root, in his, uh, the editor of the Standard Bible Commentary on at the book of Acts, page 196, wrote, quote, The storm had deprived them of the means, the time, and the inclination to prepare or to eat any regular meals, end quote. Now, notice in verse 20 that Luke included himself in his portrait of despair. The New International Version of verse 20 says, We finally gave up all hope of being saved. Did that word, we, also include Paul? Perhaps. When the angel appeared to Paul later in verse 24, he admonished Paul, quote, do not be afraid, end quote. You know, even the strongest among us can be beaten to their knees when battered hard enough and long enough by, by the storm. Some of you know what it is like to weather storms. Perhaps you know what it's like to have your marriage founder, to run again aground on the shoals of suffering, to sink in the troubled waters of failure, to find yourself off course emotionally and spiritually, 
You know what it is like to go day after day without light. And you too have been driven to your knees. In such a state of mind, we often cry out, Why? Lord, why do you allow these storms? Well, by glancing ahead to the end of this event, we could give some answers regarding why Paul, why God allowed Paul to end up in a storm. Surviving the storm probably made Paul stronger in his faith. Paul also had another dramatic demonstration of God's care for his own. Further, the storm gave Paul opportunities he would not have had otherwise. For instance, he had the opportunity to demonstrate his confidence in the Lord. Unbelievers are always watching to see how you react in a storm. Paul even had the opportunity to tell 273 pagans about the true God. Probably after they were all safely on shore, they were even ready to hear about Jesus. In the end, the storm benefited both Paul and the others. Notice, however, the phrase, in the end. While the storm was raging, those benefits were not obvious. Even so, when trials overwhelm us, it is sometimes hard to see how good can possibly come from our trouble. What should we do then when we are driven to our knees by a storm in our lives? What we need to do is Paul did. Verse 24. Pray as you have never prayed before. See Philippians 4.6. James 5.13 Pray and trust in the Lord who knows more about storms than, than we will ever know. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 9 and 10 2 Timothy 1 verse 12 Now tomorrow we will close out our morning walks for this week as we begin looking at Paul and his company surviving the storm. I hope that you can be with me at that time. Let's close our, our morning walk for today with another word of prayer. Wonderful Father, we thank you for the blessings of life. And while it may not seem like it at the time, some of those blessings even include the storms that beat down upon us. Father, help us to pray and to trust. Trust in you to bring us through the storm, to calm us while the storm rages, to strengthen us while it shatters things all around us. Thank you for this example of a literal storm in the life of Paul as he was going to Rome to preach the gospel. Father, I just thank you for all you do for us. Help us to learn more about trusting you in putting our faith in your providence as we continue in our lives. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope you have a great Thursday. Lord willing, we'll be back here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. We'll see you then.